Roberta, we still have a good number of people joining, but would you like to, shall we start? I think we can, yeah. uh, we can maybe start. Just yeah, maybe I can just do a quick introduction for a minute. You might see my colleague Martin's head popping around. I'm in the NRC office today. So look, thanks everybody for joining. Um, this is the second in our sort of protection conversation series, which hopefully will be very useful to you, which are the key considerations for cash for protection and specialised and standalone protection programming. Um, as many of you are going into the HVC process, um, we were hoping that this will be of interest to you. Roberta has gone through the whole process of updating the policy so she can reflect on the key changes and how it will affect you in the coming months and years. So, Roberta, I'm going to turn off my camera, hand it over to you. Um, we're in the background if we need anything, but I think this uh, this presentation is yours. And just from the GPC, I think um, our huge congratulations on getting this document passed. Um, I think we're very excited to see what comes. Thank you. Um, so I will just quickly intro introduce myself and share my screen so you can see also the presentation and then pass the, the floor to, to my colleagues. So I'm Roberta Gadler. I'm uh, one of the co-lead of the task team uh, uh, for uh, on cash for protection uh, of the global protection cluster. And I work uh, as a humanitarian advisor on uh, cash for protection for uh, Save the Children. And uh, I will pass the the microphone to, to Julia, who is also with me today. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Julia. I am also co-leading the Cash Protection Task Force uh, alongside Roberta. And uh, on my day-to-day -day job, I am a senior advisor uh, in cash and markets, um, working for Save the Children. Um, many thanks for having us here uh, today. Um, is, if everyone is okay, maybe I can start just giving a little bit of background on this presentation. Okay, super. Um, so today we want to present you uh, one of the key documents that came out of a uh, let's say um, relatively uh, long and very relatively comprehensive uh, process of uh, discussing and trying to iron out um, a little bit more what is cash for, cash for protection. So as a starting point, I'm just going to give you a bit of background to explain you how uh, we got here. Um, so the cash flow protection task team has been existing for a few years, but uh, last year we have uh, decided that in order to advance a little bit on some um, key uh, uh, block blockages, um, we wanted to organize a workshop that would gather um, all of the different um, um, or type of organizations, donors that were involved uh, in cash flow protection in order to try to, um, let's say, speak like a more of a, a common language across organizations. Um, I think one of the key challenges, and this is not just specific to protection, is that uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, bringing together people with very different backgrounds and expertise. So I think that here, really, the fact of talking the same language is like, potentially a major challenge. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why we, we decided last year to all meet in person to try to uh, discuss all of this. Um, out of this workshop, uh, a lot of agreements came out and all of these um, are available also in um, uh, the report that you can see on the screen that is available online on some key agreements on uh, key aspects for uh, cash flow protection. However, there were still some uh, pending points that we felt required uh, a lot more work. And in order to uh, address those, we decided to uh, set up a sub working group as part of the, the, the task team. Um, that started uh, September last year um, so that we could uh, unpack a little bit more some of these technical aspects. Uh, as part of this sub-working group, we decided to uh, break down our work into two main phases. The, main, the first phase was um, try to uh, better iron out some key issues related to um, uh, identification and targeting uh, transfer values uh, calculations as part of uh, standalone programming, protection programming. 
And then um, the next step was uh, working on this, but for integrated programming, which is what we are currently working on. So today we are going to present the version that uh, we finished, which is on standalone and for which we um, got the GPC endorsement a few weeks ago. Um, the next slide actually regroups a little bit what I was just talking, uh, the, the, the different breakdowns. Right now we focus on uh, specialized standalone protection and how we integrate cash into that. And then uh, the other ones will be focusing more on uh, protection integration and protection mainstreaming. Just important to have that in mind as uh, you might have some questions on some aspects that you feel might not be covered as part of this guidance. It is possible that th this is because there are these other uh, more specific specific guidances on uh, integration and mainstreaming that are coming up afterwards. Thank you, Julia. And uh, so let's go a little bit more in detail on, uh, on what we uh, on this work that uh, that Julia already presented. Uh, so as she said today, we are just focusing on the on the document on the key consideration on specialized uh, on, and standalone protection programming. However, just to give you uh, an overview and maybe a recap on the protection continuum that I'm sure that you uh, you, you know very very well, uh, but we would like to, to, to see a little bit of what we intend uh, and the application of uh, um, about CVA when we are speaking about uh, using uh, CVA for, uh, for protection outcomes. So when we speak about protection mainstreaming, of course, uh, it's uh, uh, the, the process of incorporating the protection uh, principles, uh, as you know, so the many access, uh, the non-discrimination, uh, safety and dignity, the do no harm, etc. across uh, all stages of the, of the program cycle. And uh, this includes, of course, when we are using uh, uh, CDA uh, as um, to to meet uh, uh, any any kind of uh, uh, sectoral uh, or uh, basic needs uh, no, or as a, as an outcome. Uh, so it's not applying. Uh, uh, just to protection, of course. Uh, when we speak about integration, protection integration, and as Julia said, we are still working on the specific uh, uh, consideration uh, on this uh, on this uh, sphere of the, of the continuum. But uh, of course, we 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 talk about uh, the designing programs that uh, includes uh, uh, CBA and other modalities uh, and protection to to achieve. Uh, um, protection outcomes uh, and non-protection uh, outcomes as well as well so in a in a joint uh, work uh, in terms of analysis design uh, implementation and monitoring and evaluation uh, and with a common uh, objective in the same uh, in the same program so that means that uh, of course uh, um, cba is uh, programming is used as a contribution to reduce uh, uh, risks uh, and uh, exposure um, to, to, to risk of the, of the affected uh, population and uh, um, finally, uh, so what we are uh, going to look a little more uh, today in the, is the specialized or standalone uh, protection programming that, of course, has a, a specific protection objective uh, and with the name to to respond or to prevent and or to respond to protection uh, risks uh, uh, and concerns. Uh, such as violence, exploitation, uh, deprivation or discrimination, etc. Um, and so we, we will look uh, a little bit more on uh, um, on this uh, on this uh, area of programming, this type of programming, uh, starting from the um, from a definition of uh, uh, cash for protection that it's more appropriate uh, to, to this. So the um, the general uh, there is a general agreement on uh, on the definition as julia said uh, last year uh, a lot of uh, actors uh, uh, convened in a in a workshop to see which were the the definition that were already uh, common and agreed on and what was uh, what were the the gaps so in um, in terms of the of the definition of cash flow protection, that is this general agreement that uh, it is uh, an intervention whereby cash and voucher assistance is used uh, as a modality to contribute to to, to address the, the individual or the household uh, protection needs, and this means that uh, um, 
CBA is one of the modalities uh, that include, of course, uh, also in-kind uh, service provision and um, and that uh, contribute to, to the protection uh, outcome. So within the, the protection programming, it is part, CBA is, is part uh, of the bro this, uh, broader uh, protection uh, strategy to, to address uh, protection concerns and to, um, yeah, to have um, to reduce the occurrence or the severity of the, or the impact of, of specific uh, protection risks. Um, and that it's uh, in, in a case, uh, in a situation when uh, an individual or uh, the household is uh, facing uh, immediate risk or harm or uh, um, harm or concern, protection concerns that uh, ne negatively impact uh, their well-being. So the, the evidence that uh, we have and we used also for uh, for this uh, note to develop this note uh, demonstrate that cash alone is not uh, the suitable approach when we want to directly achieve protection outcomes in a sustainably uh, way. So uh, that's why we insist on that that cash for protection is should always be uh, considered as. A, um, integrated into the protection specialized and individualized uh, assistance or a protection uh, program, which can include uh, case management, uh, um, protection monitoring, uh, or other for, uh, protection activities. And uh, it can be both uh, responsive or uh, remedial. Uh, and finally, uh, what is important also to remind uh, is that the use of uh, uh, CDA, so as a standalone in, in intervention, does not correspond to cash for protection. So the provision of cash without uh, these other uh, protection services uh, or activities cannot be defined as, um, as a protection at activity itself. Please, Julia. Thank you. So on, on this specific topics, there is often uh, some confusion and some questions around uh, what is the difference between cash for protection and multi-purpose cash assistance. Um, the, the, the nuance is relatively straightforward in the sense that a multi-purpose cash assistance program is going to aim at meeting basic needs and is going to be designed in order to meet those basic needs. A cash for protection intervention is designed to enhance uh, protection outcomes, to provide support in order to overcome some barriers that relate specifically to protection. So the design of the cash for protection intervention is going to be exclusively tailored around that aim. Um, here we included like just a couple of like key nuances. So the MPCA, it comprises of transfers. Uh, for those of you that have worked with MPCA, you might know that some are uh, one-off, some are periodic, and they are built in a way that will meet multi multiple needs, hence the word multi-purpose. Sorry, I'm struggling a bit with that one. <laughs> um, uh, it can be used uh, for to meet households' basic needs, uh, and it can be used also in uh, to meet recovery needs. Cash protection, we outline three key points. It focuses on using only cash to, uh, cash assistance to, enha to enhance protection. Uh, it is never used in itself to meet exclusively socioeconomic vulnerability. In this case, it links with what um, uh, Roberta was saying. Uh, in that case, then, that would be a different type of program. If you're targeting exclusively to meet basic needs, then it might not be a uh, cash protection. Um, and again, there is really a, a, um, a very important new nuance is around the causality analysis. It is the causal link between a clearly identified protection concern or risk and the analysis of how the CVA is going to contribute to reducing this risk um, that is really going to make uh, an intervention capture protection. So um, in the in the note uh, we included also uh, this uh, graphic that uh, intend, is intended to resume uh, the the key steps when we are speaking about uh, cash flow protection in uh, standalone or specialized protection intervention. Um, 
um, and I will give you just a, a brief uh, explanation of it. So the, the starting uh, point as a precondition that we also included is to establish a referral mechanism and, and links with the, with the, the, the MPCA uh, actors. Uh, so in need of, uh, of cover basic needs for, for the people who are targeted. So the, um, when you go down on the on the scheme, so the protection and risk analysis, uh, it's really the, the first uh, step um, that aims to identify the, the main protection risks uh, that are faced by the, by the population and um, also, uh, of course, the, the, the protecting uh, factors and the, the factor that uh, contribute uh, um, to, to the risk uh, as uh, uh, economic drivers. So such analysis uh, um, allows uh, the actor to, to assess uh, uh, the, the role of, uh, of CBA uh, in, uh, in this case to, to address, of course, the, um, the economic uh, factors related to the specific protection uh, risks that have been uh, identified. And uh, also which other kind of uh, uh, intervention, protection intervention should be uh, included in the program to address non-economic uh, factors. So based on this analysis, uh, the protection intervention uh, um, is defined to establish which kind of activities are appropriate. Um, and this can include a variety, variety of activities um, as uh, protection monitoring, uh, safe referrals, case management, uh, um, community-based protection, etc. So in the, this is uh, the phase of the of the program design um, in which uh, the, the protection act, uh, actor will also uh, determine which uh, modality will be relevant uh, for the different uh, components of the protection intervention. That may include uh, uh, cash, of course, as we are speaking of that, but also in-kind assistance or uh, service um, provision uh, or vouchers uh, if, uh, if that is um, uh, more appropriate. So we will look a little bit more uh, afterwards uh, on uh, on the key consideration for the determination of the of the transfer value when we are speaking about uh, cash. Um, first, uh, I wanted to go through uh, the the identification and uh, and selection uh, consideration that are. Uh, um, included in the note, of course. And uh, so, as I said, uh, the protection risk, risk analysis is the, the starting point as we are speaking about the protection programming. So, um, the analysis allows to, to, uh, to de identify the, the main protection risk. Uh, um, as you can uh, see, we can use, the, of course, the, the equation that, uh, that you have on the uh, on the top right corner of the of the slide, so we see uh, analyzing uh, the main uh, threats and vulnerabilities and the capacities, uh, of course, of uh, of people uh, that are mm, usually different uh, uh, for uh, different groups of uh, of people in terms of gender, age, and uh, other characteristics that has to be uh, taken into consideration no? for, uh, related to the specific uh, context. So while the this process uh, um, can be um, uh, can be followed in, in different ways. Uh, uh, conducting the protection analysis is really essential to decide whether the the cash for protection is pertinent. Uh, um, and is the pertinent type of uh, of response. And uh, for that, for uh, the the cash for protection to be to be effective, it's important to to identify specifically this uh, link between the protection risks and uh, the how the the CDA or the cash can contribute uh, uh, directly to to the protection outcome in this in this case. So um, whether the identification uh, of, of the of the recipients uh, is uh, direct. Uh, um, that means, for example, through uh, a protection activity, case management, or psychosocial support, or monitoring, protection monitoring, or it is uh, indirect, um, notably through uh, internal or external uh, referral. So the cash uh, should be 
always integrating in a broader protection response, as I said uh, uh, before. And that means also that uh, it, it doesn't require uh, a dedicated uh, targeting methodology or strategy. So it is really based uh, on the assessment. Uh, the selection of the of the cash poor protection recipients uh, um, is made uh, by the protection actors and based uh, on the um, so on the individual protection uh, assessment and of course taking in con into consideration the principle of do no harm uh, and to ensure that uh, the, the C4P will not put uh, the individual or the household to, to further risks and a last point uh, here uh, it's important to consider that uh, uh, the fact that the family or the individual receives uh, other forms of CVA or MPCA should not be a disqualifying factor uh, to receive uh, cash for protection. As uh, we said, the, the objective the, is of the, these two forms of assistance is different and therefore that should not be um, exclusive. And I let you with Julia for the notes on, on the transfer value. Thanks, Roberta. Uh, one of the main questions that very often comes up at this stage is how much do I transfer in cash for protection? So this is like a very, very common question that comes up. And the answer is that it depends on your case. Um, unlike other sectors where we can quantify how much meeting a certain need costs, for example, more or less we can standardize how, how much uh, it costs per month for a household to eat or to pay for rent. For protection, it is impossible to determine a standard or an average because risks and each case are individual. So um, in that sense, the guiding principle is that where the, whether it is the transfer value or how many times should I transfer a specific amount to a case, both things need to be designed and determined to address a specific protection risk. Transfer values should therefore be tailored and relevant to the specific protection needs and issues based on the actual costs of the service or goods that you're trying that you're trying to address. Um, in order to meet uh, the specific protection needs. So this is something that, for example, as part of case management, you can uh, build into your case management plan. If there is a need to meet a specific service that the case cannot pay for because of any sort of financial barriers, this is typically what you're going to try to uh, target. So transfer values for cash flow protection are need to be determined at the individual level as much as possible versus being standardized. Of course... Um, sorry, Julia, in... can I... Sorry, I'm oh, yeah. very sorry to interrupt you. Some of the colleagues are pointing out there's an image on the corner of the presentation, which means they can't see the full uh, text box. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry. Is it okay now? No. Yes. Ah, sorry. No worries. Um, where was I? Uh, yes, in terms of, uh, obviously, that's uh, once that's understood, um, there's obviously the operational challenge of, OK, but how do I know how much it's going to cost and so on and so forth. So in addition to the information that can be gathered as part of the uh, protection activities, other ways can be uh, to uh, conduct some uh, basic market surveys in order to understand what um, are the cost of, uh, let's say, most common, maybe, uh, types of services that are required as part of protection. It doesn't necessarily mean that this is what you're going to be using as a standard or this is what you're going to be using to make an average to transfer to everybody the same amount, but it means that at implementation stage, you will have a reference point that will indicate you more or less how much to, um, to, to include into the transfer value calculations, depending on different types of goods and services. And this is also an exercise that um, it's called market assessment in the cash world, but that in practice in the protection world also exists when you do, for example, service mapping. It's information that is uh, also available. Um, there are additional uh, key aspects to consider uh, now that I've explained a little bit like the, the rationale. Um, obviously, when you calculate the transfer value, as 
for a selection of participants, um, it's important, important to consider the do no harm. So if you're going to transfer an amount that is like extremely, extremely high compared to others in the exact same community, uh, is this like creating additional risk for the specific case? So always think about uh, whether we are creating additional harm in by transferring a certain amount uh, to a certain case. Um, one of the things that is helpful, uh, at least to, to me to conceive, is really trying to see um, this as uh, financial barriers. So try to think what are the key financial barriers that prevent this specific case from accessing a certain service or um, reuniting with uh, with family or you know like trying to understand really to seeing this as uh, financial barriers that can really help you to then break it down and uh, better calculate the transfer value that can uh, support at least mitigating or addressing some of these uh, barriers to reach a protection outcome. In the next slide, we also have a couple more um, key aspects to consider. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning of these slides, very common question, uh, what, uh, how many transfers should I make, at which frequency? Again, this really depends on the case and on the situation. You can have, as part of um, your case management plan, situations where with just a one-off transfer, this, uh, a specific protection risk might be um, uh, mitigated. In other situations, you might need to do uh, more uh, frequent transfers. In other situations, you were thinking you will just need one, and then actually two months later, you also need another one. So it really, it needs, again, as for the transfer value, it needs to be tailored to, to each case. Um, so it can be both one-off or recurrent. Um, another uh, key question that often comes up is around conditionality and restrictions. Um, very often, and this is not just as, like for the protection sector, it's also another sector, there is a tendency to try to think that by creating uh, restrictions or conditionality, we are going to have better sectorial outcomes. Whenever possible, in cash flow protection, we should be offering full choice and autonomy to recipients, meaning that uh, the transfer should be unconditional and unrestricted. Unrestricted means that, yes, you calculate the transfer value to meet certain needs. However, you're not going to uh, force the person to use the money once it's transferred to specifically spend on that. Obviously, as part of the protection activity, uh, you can accompany the case to think through what is the best approach. And we also have like some toolkits that we can recommend afterwards that also contribute to that. But you will not uh, suspend the assistance if the person uses the money to buy something else than what was originally planned. Uh, similarly, and uh, I know that sometimes this happens, um, you're not going to ask for receipts. You don't have to prove anything at the end and you don't have to ask um, a recipients to provide any proof of how they have uh, spent the money. Around conditionality, conditionality can be um, excellent in certain circumstances um, where you will try to um, to build a, a condition for the case to receive assistance. It can be uh, participated, participating to certain um, sessions, uh, participating to some activities, um, but it's most of the time not necessarily required. And it's also something that is operationally uh, not the easiest uh, thing to implement. So really try to think uh, around these two points. Is it needed and is it going to contribute to improve uh, the, the specific case that you're working on? If no, or if you don't have the certainty, it is not required. That is a little bit the logic. Um, and then finally, last point on referral systems that should be established to address economic drivers through standard CVA and MPCA interventions. Something that you're going, you might be observing uh, very often is that um, in certain uh, situations, uh, a case might require cash flow protection um, assistance to overcome a multiple, uh, multiple types of uh, challenges, and some of those are very specific to um, 
to uh, to uh, in inability to meet basic needs. In these situations, what is recommended is really to try it first to work on referral systems, uh, trying to see if this case can be enrolled, for example, in a standard, standard uh, multipurpose cash program, uh, if you're working in context with social protection, whether um, supporting them to receive assistance through social protection can address those parts, um, uh, before considering to use cash for protection to cover those. Um, that is like really the, 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 the best approach in the sense that these types of intervention are designed to meet basic needs. So if this is something that you're seeing as part of your case, then the recommendation is to, uh, is to establish this type of referral system. Um, and then obviously this is something that requires uh, preparatory steps uh, and coordination with like different types of actors, including um, uh, CBA actors, to try to understand where they're working, where they're providing this type of assistance and service, and what would be the best way to establish these referral systems in a safe uh, manner. Over to you, Roberta. Thank you. So I'll just uh, quickly um, conclude conclude a little bit on, on the on the note, uh, just to telling you that we, we tried also to to give some examples of how it can um, look uh, in, uh, in reality. Uh, so what is uh, uh, cash for protection and what is not. So these are some examples that are included in the note. And um, uh, so just uh, uh, to give you an idea, so in um, on, the, on the left side, uh, you can see what uh, can be considered as a cash for protection. In the first case, uh, we can have a situation where there is a person missing civil documentation, for example, and for this reason, the person is facing uh, uh, rights, uh, recurring rights violations, such as uh, risk of being arrested uh, or restriction of uh, freedom uh, of movement, etc. So in such case, uh, cash for protection uh, can be used uh, as a uh, um, as a, a, a modality to, to respond to the cost uh, associated to, to the issuing of civil documentation. And uh, this can uh, include uh, the lawyer's fees or the court fees, uh, uh, the cost of, uh, of, the, of the document, the civil documents, or the transport to access uh, these kind of services, etc. And associated to that, uh, uh, other services uh, such as legal, ass legal assistance, uh, uh, psychosocial support, or awareness, or uh, outreach um, would accompany uh, CBA, the, the cash assistance, to constitute the, the cash for protection. Another example is uh, when within uh, case management, uh, for example, that there is identified the need uh, for the person to uh, to uh, have a, uh, to receive a psychosocial support, but these uh, kind of services are not uh, in the same location, and the person doesn't have uh, uh, the the financial means uh, to to access uh, these services. Um, so in this case, the cash flow protection for protection can be used to uh, afford uh, the, the transport and allow the person to receive uh, the, um, uh, the, the psychosocial support uh, that uh, he or she, she needs. So that's also uh, a good example of cash for protection. And uh, finally, we can have a situation where uh, um, uh, at risk uh, person, uh, let's say, for example, a woman with her children are living uh, with um, with an individual exposing them to to a threat um, that can be domestic violence or other kind of uh, uh, of threat or violence. That um, so if if uh, in the case that this person can't move out from from the home, so the from the the threat uh, that uh, she or he is facing. Uh, because of uh, the lack of uh, financial means, for example, to pay rent or to cover other basic needs, uh, uh, the cash for protection can be provided uh, to, to overcome these uh, financial barriers uh, and to enable the person who is uh, at risk uh, uh, to be less physically exposed to, to, to this threat. And uh, again, accompanied uh, by other protection activities, uh, this constitutes also an example of cash for protection. 
on the other side, on the on the right, you have examples of what uh, is not considered cash flow protection. Um, so, of course, uh, uh, the the cash uh, to purchase uh, other sectoral uh, um, items or needs, uh, such as uh, pharmaceuticals that consider sectoral health cash uh, or other kind of um, items uh, for uh, shelter or rent that are also specific. Uh, um, as uh, to, to the sector, to the shelter sector, or educational materials that is uh, uh, usually cash for uh, for education. So where they are not uh, directly related to the protection to a protection needs, uh, this is not considered cash for protection. Or um, on a second example, when uh, cash. Uh, for example, is provided for food to a female-headed household as a strategy to uh, to mitigate the risk uh, for uh, for her to engage in survival sex, but this is not uh, um, the situation. This uh, risk of survival sex is not resulting from the uh, analysis of the of the protection risks. Um, so it's not. Uh, uh, something that uh, has been uh, assessed uh, or uh, through the, the general analysis or uh, through an individual assessment. So you you see again uh, when there is this contextualization and uh, and protection risk analysis, um, it is not um, it cannot be considered as um, as cash for protection. And uh, finally, uh, also when uh, uh, the cash is provided to to um, to cover basic needs of a category of vulnerable people can be, for example, person with uh, with disabilities, um, as uh, the objective is to cover the basic needs. This is not uh, also cash for protection, and as uh, you as uh, we said before, and and you know, um, this. Uh, um, goes um, more on protection mainstreaming and MPCA uh, actors, of yeah, course, have the, the responsibility to mainstream protection and disability inclusion. Julia, if you want to. Yes, uh, so just to uh, close uh, very quickly on this topic, just to mention that um, uh, as part of the, um, the CIVOBTT, we have developed quite a lot of resources over the past few years that can um, help you <laughs> going through this entire process. Um, so we have developed, um, uh, updated, sorry, our uh, stock taking paper in 2024. Um, we've also um, conducted some uh, more, uh, some uh, studies that are more specific to certain responses. Uh, such as uh, the Ukraine response uh, and relevant to the test team that we have set up um, to support that response uh, specifically. Uh, so this is a little bit of a learning from um, providing that, uh, that support for uh, over uh, two years. Um, we also have some uh, tip sheets that are more specific to um, uh, some protection topics, excuse me, um, one that is more specific to uh, child protection, one on HLP, and one more specific to mine action, keeping in mind that there is also obviously the equivalent resources for GBV that were already developed. So we're just highlighting those here because they are they are new. Um, we already mentioned the, the, the Rome um, cash flow protection workshop report that you can see on top of the right. And then there is actually a lot more that doesn't fit into this slide, but everything is available on our dedicated e-library on the GPC um, website. And then I think that's uh, that's it. And over to you for questions. Maybe just uh, I know that some of the members of the sub working group who, who worked uh, on this uh, document are uh, are in this call, so. I would just to invite them to to provide also their comments or to respond to some questions if they feel like. Please, this this was really a a group work. So happy to have also your your voice. I think we have one hand up already. Amina, would you like to jump in? 
thank you, Lisa, and uh, thank you so much, uh, colleagues, uh, Roberta, Julia, and for GBC to arrange this uh, very, very useful uh, session. Uh, my name is Amina, and I'm working with the Protection Cluster team in Palestine. Um, I just wanted to highlight like uh, <clears throat> a couple of points um, from the uh, field experience here in Palestine. Um, I guess all of them are linked together, but um, it's a kind of like uh, also uh, getting seeking your advice on this. Um, so, for example, the um, the planning for um, cash for protection programs is really challenging. Uh, due to the fact that it's um, a, a bit complex and uh, sometimes protection needs are unpredictable in some in some contexts and in, in some areas. And this is really unlike the other uh, cash programs, including MPCA even. Even though MPCA is a, is a, is a cash uh, program that is really aiming to at the end, um, like um, um, having protection outcomes on on people's lives and uh, and rights, uh, but but it's it's a bit easier to plan for for that uh, for that cash. While uh, cash for protection requires like careful targeting and context uh, specific approaches to address like vulnerabilities and also uh, needs. Um, like um, I was really, um, I, I was really like um, thinking that um, uh, within this complexity in in planning for such programs, uh, and uh, in order to get like clarity on how much flexible uh, these interventions could be, in in especially in the very complex uh, context. Uh, for example, um, I know that case management could be one of the key uh, key elements in or approaches in identifying uh, the need uh, for cash for protection and uh, to have a safe uh, referral uh, mechanism as well. Uh, but we know that also we uh, there is a classification uh, under cash programs for what we call case management uh, fund that is coming uh, as a top up uh, to uh, like to complete uh, the process of uh, doing the case management rather than just go and refer people to uh, other like um, partners and so on to, to reduce some harm and to reduce some uh, let's say bureaucracy in, in providing uh, services um so like this is a bit um not really um i think it's it's a bit complex even for uh, for for ourselves as cluster coordinators to really have clear um clear cut between multi purpose cash and cash for protection again i know that like it, it was brilliant how you dis described some examples and some differences uh, while I think sometimes when there is a multi-purpose purpose cash program uh, in some specific context, the uh, cash for protection should be or could be, let's say, limited and humble sometimes. So, so we need really to identify, identify very strongly and very specifically why we should use cash for protection while the family is receiving multi-purpose cash, even though uh, when multi-purpose cash is identified sometimes or the list of targeted people uh, is identified, uh, it's going through not necessarily inclusive process. Sometimes partners are getting a list from uh, a governmental party or let's say, um, let's say an authority or or from like community representatives uh, uh, or representative uh, representation party. And this is not uh, identified by people who are specialized in protection. 
There is, of course, protection mainstreaming within multipurpose cache, but we know that it's a bit uh, sometimes causing it not really um, strongly established in MPCA, which is really causing further harm. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for this. Uh, I'm just going to give a couple of uh, elements of response, and then I don't know if other colleagues from the from the sub working group team want also to complement or Roberta. Um, the the first one is that um, uh, very I mean uh, in terms of very concrete next steps, we have been in touch with some colleagues um, uh, specifically for Gaza. And uh, we've been supporting uh, the design of um, of uh, clear SOPs that are specifically touching on some of the points that you have mentioned. And I'm thinking on the uh, famous emergency case management fund and the difference also with cash flow protection. So just just to flag that this um, that we we have uh, started supporting a little bit on that, and and I hope that. Um, we can pick up this discussion also also after um on the um yes you're absolutely right the way that we target for multi-purpose cash assistance is not necessarily uh not even necessarily protection sensitive it's because multi-purpose cash has its own uh objectives and has its own way of determining who should be prioritized as part of of these objectives so that's that's why it's not necessarily relying on this is not necessarily the the shouldn't be necessarily the exclusive way um, of identifying potentially at risk people. It can be in some circumstance, some, uh, cir some circumstances and in some responses because uh, MPCA actors uh, do uh, um, collect data from a very important amount of people. So if you're looking some from, for some specific profiles, it can be great for referral. However, it doesn't necessarily need that someone who is eligible for MPCA is going to be eligible for cash protection. You're absolutely right. And this is where it is really crucial to have like the protection activity as the entry point for the identification and the prioritization of the cash for protection uh, recipient. Also, um, you are absolutely right that uh, there is multi-purpose cash assistance that can be used uh, to contribute to, uh, to reducing risk for some cases um, or to mitigate those. And not in all circumstances you will need to use cash for protection. In, if if the, the provision of MPCA is already sufficient, then that's absolutely fine. And you can continue providing assistance to that case through the regular uh, protection activities. Here we, we're really looking at cash for protection as a complement uh, to uh, MPCA whenever MPCA is, is required um, to overcome some of the specific financial barriers in addition to the basic needs that relates to uh, to protection. So that's uh, that, that's I would say the the key nuance. Um, and then finally, on the emergency case management fund, uh, I think again I, I would refer back to uh, this work that uh, has been done a little bit with the colleagues in. In, in Gaza, but there are ways of distinguishing um, when to use what uh, it's uh, as part, I mean, uh, throughout the, the implementation. I'll stop here, sorry. <laughs> I know we don't have much time. I think I was going to double check with you. Are you happy, Julia, Roberta, are you happy to stay on the line? I think we, we've got quite a few hands up. Um, no. Um, what is your Sorry. timing? I, I, I can't. I need to jump off at the hour uh, because I'm presenting on something else, but I don't know for Roberta. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, I think we still have 10 minutes. We have 10 minutes. We have five hands up um, and we have a question in the in the chat box. So maybe could I ask one of you to have a quick look at the question in the chat box from Oz, uh, who's my lovely former colleague uh, in Erbil, and uh, handing over to another one of my lovely uh, former colleagues, Ileana. I think you are first up. Thank you very much. And uh, having been part uh, of this uh, working group, uh, maybe something else that was uh, that is important to mention, uh, uh, which is also related then to the case management fund, etc. But as a general rule, I think that one of the main messages this guidance wants to pass is that cash for protection is not a programming per se. 
cash is a modality that can be used within a protection intervention. But as protection actors, there is no expectation of changing the way we wanted to design programs. The programs, the risk, etc., the risk analysis, the entry point, everything remains the same. It's simply that now we are using also another modality to be able to achieve the outcome together with the service provision, assistance, referrals, and what we have been doing until a few years ago without the use, the use of cash. So, and, and when it comes after the workshop in Rome, and what was the main, uh, one of the main issues it was also about the terminology. And the very confusing terminology where case management fund, individual protection assistance, etc., was uh, creating a little bit of confusion. Once we started working indeed on this uh, specific uh, terminology, we realized that uh, they are quite agency specific and we didn't want to enter too much into uh, definitions per se. So whatever you see here, uh, uh, applies in this guidance applies uh, to all uh, the different uh, type of cash for protection that we want to use, whether this is IPA, it's called IPA, emergency case management fund, etc. These are the general key consideration that we should uh, keep in mind when designing. But I think that the other very important point is the previous one that I made. There is no cash for protection programming uh, because the first uh, introduction made that by, by Julia Roberta was saying that cash alone cannot is not considered useful to achieve protection programming. So it's simply a modality on something that we are that we have been doing for for a very long long time that can help us and the people we serve in our programming. That's all. Thank you. And I see Kasia on line. <laughs> Over to you. Hello, I, can I go ahead with my question? Kasia here, Protection Cluster Ukraine. You should go ahead. <clears throat> yes, thanks. No surprise, Eliana, I'm speaking as well. and Just reiterating, very happy this guidance has come out. It will be super helpful um, for us and uh, right away signaling that it will be good to, I mean, it may be ask a question, if uh, there is a possibility to have such presentations made also at, um, at country, at country level for partners who are implementing cash flow protection as um we will yeah we will need to be reviewing the 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 national guidance in this country operations where such exists to ensure uh, proper alignment and uh, my my question is um around maybe collaboration with uh, cash working group because that has not come up um, much in your presentation um i um you know Thinking, you know, about social transfers, where I think we've been getting quite a lot of te technical questions from from our uh, from our partners. What is 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 there a recommendation um, as to like what is it that protection cluster coordinator protection clusters should in general advise in addition to what you explained on earlier social transfer? Or can we count to some extent on cash working group? I know there is possibly some some politics around that, but what's the best? practically uh, speaking solution. Thanks for that. Thank us. Yeah, uh, I will not st speak about the, 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 the politics because I don't know them. <laughs> but what I can tell you is that generally speaking, uh, a ca the cash working group is always going to be um, acting as a support to the other clusters. So same for um, shelter, nutrition. So each uh, cluster work on like their specific guidance on how to use cash within their specific uh, sectors. And then the cash working group can come as a support, you know, so if you need to uh, conduct some specific uh, analysis if you need um I mean, now I'm thinking for examples that are not necessarily relevant for, for protection, but supporting, calculating some transfer amounts, linking up with uh, organizations that are conducting uh, some form of assessment. So that is definitely something that the cash working group um, can provide. But most of the time, it's not necessarily going to be the cash working groups that are going to lead on guidance for specific sectorial outcomes. That is something that would typically come out from uh, the relevant cluster, like I mentioned, um, shelter cluster, nutrition cluster, health cluster, protection cluster, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, that, that would be my take. But again, I I don't know everything <laughs> of everywhere. So Thanks so much. Sounds pragmatic. 
I think Jahad, you are the next up on the list, and then maybe if somebody would have a second to to answer Aus's question. I think to the other colleagues, we have three minutes left, so we're unlikely to be able to answer the questions. I suggest that maybe if you put your question in the chat, and Roberta <laughs> and Julia, we can organize a follow up to this discussion. So, Jahad, over to you. Thank you, thank you. I just wanted to say hi to Julie and like uh, I will continue and I will follow up with the questions, but like basically it's like the role of case management in cash for protection. Remember this discussion like two years ago and uh, I was surprised that you put that uh, it should cash for protection would yeah, any I know, I think there was some kind of uh, a bargain when, when you put like other consideration to for it not to be restricted and conditional. Because for me, as it's like supposed to be complementing other protection activities, it is conditioned that it's part of something else and the restriction that they, there's a need like to carry on the protection as the examples that were, that were provided by Roberta. So, but I will follow up with you uh, uh, outside. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Very, very nice to see you too. Um, the just a very quick cl clarification, and this comes again from diff I think different terminologies in what we mean by by conditionality. Um, uh, the here we're not referring to being part of case management as a condition. Um, conditionality is when you will say, okay, um, so in order to receive the cash assistance, you need to attend um, five session of uh, I don't. Uh, I, I don't have examples right now, or um, in other sectors, you need to prove that your children have been going to school each month for uh, in order to receive the next tranche of assistance. This is more the type of example that is used when we talk about conditionality, at least in, in cash transfers, but it's not necessarily linked to being involved in case management. I think um, I think our colleagues have had to put their hand down, maybe a little disappointed not to be able to go into the conversation in more depth, but I think it shows the strong interest in the topic. Um, Roberta, Julia, maybe. I just want to thank you, yes, for your, for yes, your time sorry. and then maybe. hand it over to you for any final words for this session. Thank you, Lisa. Sorry, I was jumping just to say that uh, before we close, uh, and thank you very much for, for the participation. It's, uh, it's really appreciated that there is a lot of interest on the on this topic. So uh, just to highlight on the slide that I hope you still see, uh, we put the our um, address for the for the cash flow protection help desk. So if you have a specific request of support uh, or questions that uh, you want to ask, please uh, reach out. We we are uh, here for uh, for responding uh, uh, in English, in French, in Spanish uh, as you prefer. So please uh, do reach out, uh, and we hope uh, also if uh, if there is uh, interest and the need to to have another opportunity to to discuss with you. Yes, thank you. thanks so much, everyone. And again, this is not the end of the conversation. We remain available, and yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Have a lovely day.